Welcome podcasters, you are listening to another episode of Tell Me Why, a resource for athletes, coaches, and parents in sport. Co-hosted by Dr. Ginny Christerna and U.S. Speed Skating Hall of Fame inductee Patrick Wentland. This podcast is developed as a resource for athletes, parents, coaches, and referees looking to improve player development and performance. Conversations and opinions expressed on the show are not intended as medical or clinical advice. Welcome. Today, we will continue discussing Passion Part 3. If you missed Passion Part 1 and 2, please go back and look at earlier podcasts and get caught up and then come back and listen to this one. We intend to hopefully complete and today. There's been so much to talk about. Uh, Jenny and I just, just kept going. And I, as we discussed, Jenny, I think this is just, it's one of the biggest ones for me. I think it's something I've seen in the best of the best of the athletes. They have this, they have this love, this undying passion, this relentlessness to be the best. And that helps control everything they do. Absolutely. I'm with you 187,000%. I'm not sure how that translates, but you know, that means I'm with you all the way. I agree. So I guess it deserves three podcasts to, to, to finish this one up. We talked about, you know, what it takes to be the best, the, the, what type of passion and how to control that passion. We've talked a little bit about, and I think we kind of left off with developing passion last time. And I think we'll jump back in there. If we're an, a top level athlete, if you're comparing one talented athlete with another talented athlete and they both have passion and we have, we talked about different levels of passion. So one athlete's willing to give up going out with his friends. One athlete's willing to give up alcohol. One athlete's willing to give up overeating, whatever it is, you know, who's willing to give up the most or dedicate themselves the most to improving their performance is really going to tell the difference between equally talented athletes. Oh, um, absolutely. Hands down for sure. When we, when we talk about the, the development, as we mentioned, it, it's, it's a hard, in my mind, it's a hard tool to develop. It's something that you get from deep down inside. We, we talked about being able to train talent. You can improve on talent by doing drills and skills and working out and lifting weights and improving your technique, improving passion. I'm going to go right to the psychologist on this, Jenny, and see what your, your take is on this. Well, I'm a clinical social worker. I don't want any psychologist getting all okay. upset with me. It's okay. Cause you know, they, they, they need, we need to have our spaces in our lanes. So I always Got say, it. you know, nothing personal. Just shows our our folk eye. <laughs> so, but yes, absolutely. Here's the thing, and we touched on this a bit in podcast number, passion number two, part two, I should say. And it it really goes down to motivation. You have to identify for that athlete what they're motivated. By, right. So if they're externally motivated, internally motivated, you know, what is it for them? Are they doing it for their country? Right. When they go and represent the country, you and I have worked with Olympians. Are they doing it for their family, their grandma, their mom, who they've seen struggle, things like that? They, are they doing it for money? Are they doing it because they want to be the best? Like there's no right or wrong reason to, to, to be motivated to be the best. Some are a little short lived little more short-lived than others, but they have, we have to know what they're motivated by. True. And we did talk about that a little bit. Motivation is a huge part of that. And I think finding one's motivation, even finding your own, I, I've worked with this with a few athletes I've worked with. And, you know, one I, I just had a talk with recently, the first thing he told me was, I, I don't like to lose. I don't like to lose. And I, I looked at him and I'm like, well, we need more than that. We, we need more, you know, if you don't like to lose, that's going to keep you off the back. You know, that's going to keep you just off the back. But developing that wanting to be the best is going is, is to elevate you a little bit higher than the guy who just doesn't want to lose. 
And the finding that motivation within that passion to do what it takes to do the work to get to that point, as we talked about previously, there is when you when you can develop that skill, you're willing to do whatever it takes, whatever your coach asks of you, whatever your body tells you, whatever the the work that is required for you to to mm -hmm. be the best, you're willing to do it, no questions asked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, and to piggyback off of that, because you said something quite interesting, and I had like several things that went through my head as you were talking. One of the things that I thought was quite interesting is, is what, what can you learn? Like, if you don't feel like you can learn anything from your losses, you're going to be in a tough way. Right. If you just want to, feel, I've I've heard coaches when we were over at USA Taekwondo, I've heard coaches tell their athletes just to focus on what they did well, and I'm like, that is the surefire way for them to not make any national team. They may be the best or one of the best in their dojang or in their region or in their state, but mm -mm, right because that you they don't know what they could have done differently or what they need to work on. You're just focusing on what they do well. That is part of that, but they also have to learn something from losing, you know, and even when they win, you're not just going, oh, that's so awesome. High five. Woo! You're going, that was really good. How can we make that more efficient? How can we make that smoother? How can we streamline that? And then you look, oh, where do you think you might write? Not in a wag in their, your finger in their face kind of way, but what now, you know, now let's look at what we may have misstepped on, what, what we can actually, you know, start to work on while we strengthen these things that you're really good at. And, and that kind of balance, right, that keeps the motivation going because if you lose enough, you're, you're going to give up. You're, there's nothing in it for you, right? That now you might like it, but it, I don't want to do it anymore. I'm not getting good at this. Great point. And I, 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 I agree with you 100%. So many people concentrate on their strengths. The best concentrate and can fix their weaknesses. If you are good at lifting weights and you hate doing an endurance workout, or you prefer to lift weights, hate doing an endurance workout, but endurance is your weakness and you concentrate on the lifting weights and you do a little bit of endurance because mm -hmm. you don't like it, you're not going to get better. You're not yep. going to get where you want to go. You have to be able to look at the things you don't like to do and do them until they're your favorite. You have to concentrate on those weaknesses and make them your strengths. And I'm gonna share this quote that is, that's used by pretty much every successful person at the highest level. I mean, not like the most successful person in the siblingship of your home, but in business and in sport. And that saying is, anybody can do the things that they wanna do. A successful person does the thing that they don't want to do, but it needs to be done. And that is what I think you just shared in that, yeah, if you don't want to do it, that's the thing you need to do, especially when you don't want to do it. That's just like when people say, whenever you don't want to go to the gym, that's when you should absolutely go to the gym because it is a lifestyle. And I tell people it's not a lifestyle in the way that they think about it and just kind of my physical, I need to stay in shape kind of lifestyle. That's part of it, but it's a lifestyle for your mind. It's a way of thinking in your head. You know, I, ha I have to do this thing because if I don't, it won't get done. And then, you know, that three pounds that I gain is going to turn into six pounds and it's going to turn into 12 pounds if I don't do this thing consistently today. And I tell people, you don't have to bust it out at the gym three hours a day. You go to the gym, you go for 30 minutes, you go for an hour. You just do something. You do 15 sit-ups at home on the floor. Just do something every day, a little bit of something every day, and you'll be surprised at how you build on that. And now it's, this is easy. Now I'm going to just, I ended up doing 25. I ended up doing 40. That's how you build an endurance by chipping away at it a little bit at a time. Everybody tries to take this big bite of a burger and end up choking on it. You, 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 you eat a big burger one bite at a time, not a huge bite. You can't even enjoy it if you take too big of a bite. You're going to choke and kill yourself a little bite at a time. Enjoy it. 
Yeah, no, it's it's a problem for all of us. Uh, nobody, like you said, nobody likes to do the things they don't want to do or not don't enjoy doing. The best out there concentrate on those weaknesses and make yep. them into their strengths. Find find those things that you're not so good at that you don't like doing, and get, like you said, start at the bottom. Do it once or twice. Do a few reps. Do yep. a little bit more. Do a little bit more. Pretty soon, you're like, oh, this isn't so bad. This is so this is easy. You know, I'm, I'm getting the hang of this, mm -hmm. and it's not your weakness anymore. Keep mm -hmm. working on it. Keep working on it. You want to go from fourth place to second place to first yep. place. That's a great, great, great place to start. Everybody's got a weakness. Your competition knows that weakness. They know where it is there you and go. they will expel upon it. So find out what it is and work on it. And it's not that you have to, to get rid of your weakness. You just need to know it and be on speaking terms with it, <laughs> right? You don't have to love it and embrace it. Mm -mm 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 -mm. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is that you, you need to be aware. You need to be self-aware of where you're really, really good and where you're not so good. So that way you're not blindsided, right? If I'm a righty, right, if I'm a, if I'm a, if I'm a pitcher, if I'm a batter and I'm a righty, and for whatever reason, right, I, I have to, you know, throw with my left or, or, or swing the bat on my left hand side, that's going to be really weird for me. But if I don't know that I'm a righty and it's going to be weird to, sw I'm, to swing on my left or throw with my left, when I do it for the first time, I'm not going to be ready. It's not that I'm going to be ready if I'm aware, but at least I'm aware that part is not going to startle me. That's something I know going in. How do I compensate for that? I'm not figuring it out while I'm actually going through it. That's the advantage. And then what you can say is, okay, I know I can't do X, Y, or Z very well, but I can, I might not be able to hit a home run, but I can butt this ball, right? I, I can butt the crap out of this ball. That's all I got for you. Because my eyesight and my accuracy is pretty good, whatever the case may be. So knowing your weaknesses allow you to pull on your strengths to shore that up if in the event something happens and that's all you have. I love it happens. It. And it happens all the time. Yeah. Right. And, uh, you know, it's like I, 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 like I said, a big point of that is your competition knows your weaknesses in, in any mm -hmm. sport. You know, if you're playing soccer, you maybe you're not a good dribbler. You don't have leg speed. You don't, you tire early. Your, your competition has got you figured <laughs> out. You got to figure it out and work on those weaknesses and yep. improve upon them. Even little bits is going to make a big difference. You know, this brings us really a little bit into uh, one of the notes we had today was like the fear of failure mm. with, within the sport and within passion and and not wanting, and this, you know, as we're talking about not wanting to lose or that will to win, that fear of failure and the fear of, of not being able to, to work on your weaknesses is, is a huge part of, of some athletes and their, what that stepping stone that's keeping them from getting to that next spot. It, it, some athletes that have been very successful and you got to go back and built up a good confidence to got to have to go back and start working on some basic exercises to re-improve some of the weaknesses, that's, that's that failure, that, that weakness that they're trying to work on that they, they struggle with. And it hurts mentally, it hurts physically. But again, those are those fears that need to be controlled. I, I got to say this because it's, it's giving me agita to, to not and just to sit on my hands. Go for it. It... it Young people and, and old people alike, people, you know, you're older than me, Pat. I just want to put that out there so everyone knows that. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> you, you would fall in. I'm in the middle. Okay. So I'm just, I'm going to put that out there too. But no, every, you know, everyone at, at some level on, on, on the age spectrum has a thought about failure, whether it's good or bad or in, in the middle. I'm going to say this about failure. It's the greatest teacher. And I know I don't want to bring up his name because some people might get, you know, cringy and turn us off. But, and I won't bring up his name, but the, the TV show, The Apprentice. Guess who got hired more often than the winners? It was the losers. And not the losers in, you know, the, the first episode of that season. It was, I mean, they got hired too. But it was the, the losers that 
stayed on longer who who didn't make the cut because they learned something that you're never going to learn when you always win. And I'm I'm saying this because I want to also bring up college and academics and in, in your jobs. When colleges look for folks, do they look for people, straight A folks, some Ivy Leagues? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, we, we need to keep our stats up, whatever. But I'm going to tell you the ones that stick out to admissions offices, admission officers, excuse me. And those are the ones who started off freshman year struggling, genuinely struggling. Maybe a DC, maybe even an F student. But somewhere along the way, something clicked and happened and you could see them grow. And those Fs, Ds, and Cs went to, to Cs, Bs, and As. And then they're at the top. And they, they might not be validatorian or salutatorian, but they were up there. They might even be t- the top 10% of their class, but you could see that they grew because they learned something. Those are the people that will probably graduate in four years and not flunk out their freshman year because they partied so hard or they gave up. Those are the students. Those are the employees that have grit. They have grit, and I would put $100 on them any day of the week because they will figure it out. They can come from behind, I mean, be the last place, and they will find their stride, and they mark, they capitalize on that. So failure is your best teacher, not because it's this cool thing that you hear people say as a cliche, but it truly is because if you figured out this really hard thing, If you figured out this really hard thing, especially while you're doing it, or you can reflect on this is where I misstepped, right? That is not something you can teach. That is not something you can coach. That is something that is so deep within that person. They, it's not even about the thing that they want. It could be, but this is about, look, I want to figure this shit out. I, this, I, 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 I am stuck on this and it frustrates the hell out of me. And I know. I'm going to figure this out. And I'm going to ask everybody until I get on somebody's nerves and they point me in the direction I need to go. But I'm going to sit up and I'm going to figure this out until I get it right. That is the one that you need to look out for. So when people say, oh, you know, so-and-so, they're this and they're always slow, that's the one you need to look out for. And if we can tell that slow kid, you're the one that they'll never see coming. You're the one that they will never see coming, which is why I tell all of my clients, Whatever you do, never underestimate your opponent, especially the, the long, gangly, you know, they're growing into their legs. and That's the one yep. you got to look out for. And remember I told you last episode, my son, who won the 800. Yep. Never, no one knew about him. That's the one. Those are the look, man, those are the cats you got to watch all day long. All day yep. long. Yeah, I go that over that with the, the kids I work with all the time. And I said, okay, you know who your competition is. There's A and B who have been ahead of you that you're working to beat. But I guarantee you, C and D, who you don't know who they are yet, next year, next season, they are going to catch you by surprise. And they are going to be up there beating you or pushing you. A and B you know about, but C and D, I guarantee there's going to be yep. a couple new faces there. Jay, yep. we hit, we covered passion and failure all the one. We, we found <laughs> Jenny's passion in spot, people. If you notice there, <laughs> this was great because we're, we're learning a little bit of both at the same time. And, and a big part of that that I want to touch on too is we all have failures. And, and that's, that's, a, that's a given. Mm-hmm. Some people learn from those failures and some people don't. We all make mistakes. You learn from your mistakes. Some people do, some people don't. Some people takes two, like myself, maybe two or three or four times and I get it figured out. If you can learn from your failures and mistakes the first time, and if you can learn from your coaches or your teammates' failures and mistakes the first time, you are going to rise a lot faster by not having to go through them yourselves or not having to go through them multiple times. Mm -hmm. Learning from your failures is a huge part that you hit on right there, Jenny. And I've heard one of the, I forget where I heard it recently, but there was another podcast, I believe, and it was a team talking about one of their biggest successes was after every competition, they would actually get together 
and 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 go over what they got out of say it was baseball. They're getting out of that pitcher. Oh, this pitcher is throwing me a fastball every time on the second pitch. Okay, we're gonna be ready for that fastball a mm-hmm. second pitch. Uh, he's doing this every time on the third pitch. His, his first pitch is usually a sinker or a slider, whatever it is. You you work with your team. You if your team can communicate, your coaches tell you what they see. If you listen and learn from these people that have been there, they will help you rise so much faster by learning from their mistakes, learning from their experience. <clears throat> I, I, now I'm getting me passionate about this too, because <laughs> it's huge. It's, it's, I wish I would have known this more when I was uh, com- competing because I, I ended up making those same mistakes and relearning it again myself instead of following someone else's direction or path. Mm-hmm. And learning from their mistakes, and cutting uh, cutting that time down in in half. It's just such mm-hmm. a huge, huge stepping stone. And this reminds me of another quote. <laughs> I saw this one <clears throat> on on the in, when I was in Pennsylvania for undergrad, and you know they there's all this farmland. I think it, I forget the high the main highway, and they would have like these signs, you know, reminding you of some inspirational or spiritual or or religious quote. And one said, learn from the mistakes of others. You won't live long enough to make them all yourself. And that stuck with me because I'm like, you know what? That's true. (laughs) I'm not going to live that long. (laughs) There's a lot of mistakes to be made. (laughs) Yeah. And uh, why would I go and reinvent the wheel on this stuff? I need to ask people who fail. I want to, I want to ask people who fail, not what they should, what they, you know, not because I want to learn from them how to do it, because they failed at it. But I want to ask, you know, they'll, I, I'll pull together some things that, okay, don't do this. Whatever you do, don't do that. But you, you talk to people and ask them about their failures because you will learn something. And, and there's a huge gold coin in what you just said. It's not that you'll learn how to win, and it's not that you'll learn how to lose. But what you'll learn, right, is something in their experience will resonate with something in your experience. And that is what gives you that range. That's what increases the range and depth of your experience, because there's going to be some overlap. There's going to be some overlap. So you're borrowing from their experience. You're transmuting it. So if I said to you, if you didn't have your daughters and you never, you didn't give birth physically, but if you never, if, if this is before you had kids and I said, you know what, your life is going to change. You're going to love somebody instantly like this. You'll die for them. Daughters, you'll kill for them. Sons, you'll die for them. But daughters, you'll you'll be a a murderer sitting on the porch with a shotgun. If I told you that before you ever had any children, you would go probably or maybe, or if I don't know what that looks or feels like, but okay, everyone says that it has to be true. And you go into it like, okay, this is what they said is going to happen. I don't have any personal experience, but I heard it enough where I'm ready for that, right? But it's not until you see that face with those two little squinty eyes because they're still swollen, right? And that little nose and the fingers that, and then you just, you fall in love and you go, this is what they were talking about. And there's a, there's a level, right? There is that, mm, that you get it. Now, when someone talks with you about falling in love, you go, I, I understand. Oh, right. Or if somebody has a child who almost didn't make it, there is a connection there. Like you've never had that experience, but there is an overlap of that experience where you now have borrowed because you can imagine, oh my goodness, if that were to have happened to me, I cannot imagine or fathom. So you might have not have the direct experience, but you have something that goes, but if that would, have happened. I, it would have broke me. It would have sent me into a spiral of terror, of confusion, of, of pure faith, whatever that may be for each person. And so we borrow from their experience and then you're going to make it your own. You're going to make it your own. And that's the beautiful part of listening to people who failed over and over and over again, because it also gives you an opportunity to imagine, not fantasize, but imagine what you could do instead. That yep. is the gas that fuels your passion. That yeah. goes into, oh, I could spin that, right? You People see Michael Jordan fly. He's not flying. I mean, he kind of looks like he does, but he's really not. He doesn't have wings or anything like Red Bull. But the point is, he's like, I can do that. Maybe I'll spin or maybe I'll write, but maybe I won't. Maybe I'll just admire it. 
but it's up to each person when there is that overlap for them. All of their personal experiences come together and go, oh, we could do a lot with this. Or yeah. maybe not so much. Great story, though. Yeah. <laughs> Until yeah. six years down the road, you go, oh, my God, I remember that story. And then there might be a little bit more of an overlap that helps you to relate. Yeah, it's really all about, like you said, lear learning from someone else's or your own. And, and, and I'll just go back to touch on that. Don't just experience failure or mistakes. You have to go back and look at them. You have to go back and study them. You have to figure out what you did wrong so you don't do it again. Learn from your mentors, your coaches, your family members who have done it, parents who played the same sport or something and say, hey, tell me, tell me what you, tell me where you made your mistakes so I don't make the same ones and, and, or tell me your successes so I can use that as well. But so many people continue to make mistakes without learning from them two or three, four times, sometimes maybe more than that. Shame on you. You have to, the sooner you, you learn from them, the sooner you're not going to make those mistakes again and you're going to continue to improve. And I want to add to that, Pat, because there's, there's someone listening who goes, I want to learn, but I can't. I don't know why I can't learn. And I'm going to tell you why you can't learn. You can't learn because you're defensive. There's something about being embarrassed or ashamed or resistant to the learning because that pulls up, that triggers you to think that I'm bad, I'm not good enough. Like you have to work with a clinician or a sports psychologist or whatever. You have to get to the root of that because if you're so heavily defended that you can't admit when you've made a mistake, you're never going to learn. So if you, yeah. if you are noticing that there's a pattern, no one can tell you anything or you keep doing the same thing over and you're like, clearly I said to don't put your finger in the socket with a fork and you keep doing it. <laughs> Like, it's not that you don't understand what I said or the consequence of that. Why do you keep doing that? Right now we're dealing with something a little deeper. And this is where I think us bringing in coaches and parents and having that conversation about how they might impact or play a role in that. This would be a good segue. I'm just, I'm talking. Yeah. I need some more. No, that's great. And I'm drinking my coffee and this, woo, lots of caffeine. I'm a I can fire feel buddy. It. I, I, I can feel it. You know, and then the other part of that too is, so we do have a whole nother segment on learning and being able to open your mind to learning and, and that's how you get better. If you just get stuck in your old ways and I'm just going to keep doing it this way, you're not going to get better. So we do have a whole nother segment and that's a great one because yes, the best athletes out there, they need, they learn how to learn and mm -hmm. accept change and, and keep going with that. And that actually is, is a little bit more about too, what I was going to mention was that fear of the failure and the fear of learning, as you put it. So many people are afraid to try those new things and do things in fear of it not working. Case in point, I, I've been working with some athletes lately on really trying to change technique and try and upgrade from what the norm is. Everybody else is doing it this way. Well, yeah, if you want to keep doing it that way, you're going to be just as good as everybody else. <laughs> I'm trying to be a little proactive and change things around and say, okay, you know, they're doing it this way. Maybe if we tried it this way and, and added this to it, we can do it better, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and well, I'll show them, okay, let's try it like this. And they're like, oh, I don't know. No, <laughs> nobody else is doing it that way. Right. Exactly. No one else is doing it. And this is either going to work or it's not going to work. It's going to bomb. Or you're going to be the only one that does it. And everybody's going to try to do what you're doing. Like you, yeah. you will be the trendsetter. Oh my goodness, Pat. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, absolutely. and although, absolutely. you know, what also happens, you don't do it. And all of a sudden next year, your competition is doing it and, and you're going, oh, damn. That look right at, there. look at, I, we were working on that. I should, I should have kept, kept working on that, but don't that be right afraid there. to try those new different techniques or styles or, or whatever it is, equipment, nutrition program, whatever it is, give it a shot, take notes, see, see what's different. But you, in order for you to be better, yeah, the best of the best, you think that they just followed what everybody else was doing? 
they were creative enough to develop another way, a better way, something that they thought they'd try. Let me give this a try. See if it's going to help. See if it's worse. If it doesn't work, go back to something else. But yeah, that fear of not, that fear of I'm going to give this a try and it's not going to work, or I'm afraid to try this because I'm wasting my time. Or yeah, okay. You're going to look silly. That's a huge, look silly. I'm look silly. No, that's a big part of it. And I think, I, honestly, some of the athletes I've been working with, I'm like, try it this way. And like, I, I, I think that's part of it. They're like, well, I, I don't see anybody else doing it that way. I'm going to look silly. Well, yeah, you're going to look silly as you're passing them. So, <laughs> that's a you good know, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think they're going to be laughing real hard at you. So it, it doesn't hurt to give it a try. You have that's to right. have an open mind. You have to be able to expand and, and go on to to other things and learn as we will go in a couple of weeks. We'll talk about that a little bit more. I'm excited. This, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that the, the athletes who are listening, they, they are getting a lot out of this and, and I do want, and I know we're, is it okay, Pat, if we go over our 30, we're already over 30. Yeah. Minutes. Yeah. So and actually people? what I wanted to try and do is continue this on how, how we can, we talk about the athletes a lot, but let's, let's include the parents and coaches a little bit. Yeah. If they have, if they have the, the athletes that are, have that fear of failure yeah, yeah. or that they can't find that motivation and, and other things, what, can, what advice do we have for them that we can throw their way? Well, I'm going to let you do the coaches because you are a coach. <laughs> Go for it. So you, right, you, you got start with the coach. And... Okay. Wow. <laughs> okay. I can start okay, with the coaches. So enough. honestly, yeah, it's, you know, it, it's, as far as I'm like a coach, I'm always looking at different ways for, with different athletes. Every athlete learns differently. They understand differently. Uh, I, I think it's kind of like a teacher in school. Like I, as I'm spitting out information at them, I have to be watching their eyes, their facial expressions. What kind of reaction am I getting? Am I, am I getting that light bulb going off? Be like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, I got it. Or am I getting the, mm -hmm. the blank stare of, uh, I'm not following you. And, and as soon as you see that, you know, you know how to redirect. You, you, do you change what you're saying? Do you go on, you try and explain it differently. Just like trying to find an athlete's motivation and passion. If you're, if you're pushing them in one direction and they just don't seem motivated or, or changing or improving or working any harder, you got to try another, another direction. And it's a lot of work, especially if you're a coach working with multiple athletes or a larger team. You know, you're conforming to individualism is, is, is so much more, more work, but at the same point, it's going to take you a lot further with it. So again, for, I think from the coach's standpoint, give them as many opportunities, watch their eyes, watch their facial expressions, learn from them what works for them, what doesn't work for them, and, and redirect your train of thought and the way you, the way you work with them at all over the, over the time. And you... The second part of the, about that with failures we talked about was don't, for one, don't get on them negatively with failure. That's mm -hmm. the best time for a coach to work with an athlete to say, hey, what'd you learn from that? And what would you do better? I think after, just about after every race yep. that I see with the, the athletes I work with that doesn't turn out so well, one of my first comments with them is, what do you think? How'd it go? And then my second comment to them is, all right, what would you do different? What'd you learn from that? And if they can pull out one or two things that they would learn from that race, that reaction, that, that competition, and use that not to make the same mistake again, that, that failure is a huge win. Mm -hmm. And that's very much in line with what we tell athletes, right? We, you know, we'll talk with the athlete after and we'll say, you know, how did, how, how did it go? And then we say, well, what three things did you do well? What three things do you think you need to work on? So same formula, it doesn't change. When a coach does it right afterwards, it's so much more powerful and it can get anchored so much more quickly because now the, the athlete owns it. The athlete owns them. I do well with this and I like that, but I need to work on this, right? It might be the, the opposite side of the same coin. I'm, I was really good with my turns, but I need to lean a little bit more. I could, I could have done that better. Right. So it doesn't yep. have to be three new things. It could be, you know, nuances of the things that they did well, that they really thought they they nailed. But I, they noticed something right now. What you're teaching them is how to coach themselves in the middle of a performance. 
or a competition, however you want to look at yeah. it. Yeah, and learn not to make that same mistake again. And mm-hmm. you know, maybe it will happen a second time, but go over it again. And, the, and, and some athletes take a little bit more, and then they mm-hmm. get it, and then they get it, and it doesn't happen again. What I about agree. parents, Jenny? I always say, remember, don't make it about you. Like, don't, don't make it about you. And whenever you start off the bat criticizing your kid, and this, these are the red flags I tell parents. So you get a piece of paper and, and something to write, a pencil or a pen, not while you're driving, of course. But whenever you, the run red flag that you know you, the, I'm going to give you several, but one of the red flags that you know you've made it about you is when the first thing you do is criticize your kid. Whether that is you sucked, which I've heard parents say to their 12, 13, eight-year-old. I got to share a story really quick with you. We were at a U5 soccer game. My kid was in a rec soccer league for five-year-olds. And I heard this horrid grandmother. Grandmother. And she just looked like she had a miserable and unhappy life. And her job was to make everyone she loved feel as miserable as she did. She said the most just I, I'm beyond words because I still hear them. She was like, you suck. And the girl's name was Emily. You yeah. suck. What are you doing? Get up and move. What are you? And she was cursing. Wow. Kind of freaking five-year-old. And the mom and dad are just standing right there. And I just thought, I feel bad for that little girl because she's either going to be a bully or she's going to get bullied or she's going to have yeah. a tough time. And I'm convinced that a lot of these teenagers who struggle with self-esteem and with um, self-harming behaviors, I, 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 I don't know if there's a recent study, in that, and I, so I'm going to hold my tongue, but I wonder what criticism and, and bullying might have been like in their family. So yep. all whatever, stems from grandmother. Right. I'm just <laughs> saying, with that kid, with Emily, poor, bless her heart. Right. So... Whenever you start off criticizing or complaining or attacking your kid, you've made it about you. That's the first red flag. You might not like what I'm saying, but you don't have to. I don't really care, right? The second red flag is when you say, okay, well, I did it this way or I. And, you know, it's good to share, but not when you're comparing yourself to your kid. Why, why, how you were kind of Al Bundy-ish, you know, that touchdown, four touchdowns in that one, you know, season and senior year, let it yeah. be about the kid. And if the kid's like, hey, dad, hey, mom, how did you do it? But, oh, well, your mom had a little move here and there. Your dad had a little swag left and right. But this is how we did it. And we can see a little bit of that in you, but we can also see a little bit of you coming out, too. So whenever you bring yourself and compare your kid to you, you've made it about you. And the last one, the last one, last one, last one is when all you can think about is you lost. Did you win? (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Then I'm just five is not that important. Even at 15, it's not that important. You know, it's just like, because no, and here's the thing. They don't even care about the sport. They care. Kids don't even want their parents to come to see them win. Sometimes they're on really crappy teams. Like in high school, you, you, you're, if, you're, if you have a crappy soccer or football or baseball team, you don't want your parents to come and cheer every time you lost. They want their parents to come and just see me. Hey, mom, did you see the thing? They might have just done one thing that whole game. Or mom, I played for five minutes. Did you see me? Yeah. Right. They just want to be seen by the parents. So I always tell parents as soon as the game is over, oh, my God, that was so, you were so good. You, 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 you. Wow, that was, oh, oh, that must have been a tough loss. But I got to tell you, that was the best I've ever seen you play. You got so much better. Yeah. Right? So I I would just suggest that to parents because we're old. You know, if, if, if David Beckham and them can sit at a, their kid's soccer game and just shut up. And just yeah. encourage and support their kid. Yeah. You non-professional anything in sports. I'm sure you can. You can. You know, control yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Then, if you really want, if the if the child is adult enough, old enough to discuss where that they can do better, you know, and yeah. maybe it, 
maybe there's some drills you can go and work on with them after as a parent. Absolutely. And, and, hey, you did this well, but yes. you know, look at, you want to get better at this? Let's go work on that and yes. improve. And that's what kids remember. I don't care if they're 30 throwing the ball with dad. That's what they remember. Because let me tell you something, moms and dads. You are their first hero. Mom, you're the first person they fell in love with. The first person from the time that they were in your belly and you were talking to them or not. Maybe you were throwing up. I don't really know. But you were the first person that they fell in love with. Your voice, your smell, your your energy. You were the first person in dance. You were the first hero. The first hero. They see everything about you and go, my dad will destroy your dad because my dad <laughs> is awesome. My dad's you. Superman. Oh, yeah. There you go. Everybody's dad is Superman to them. Yep. Don't destroy those illusions too soon. They will get destroyed soon enough when they de-idealize you. Yep. Let them have you for as long as they need you. They don't need any help seeing you as a human being in all of your amazing, wonderful form and all of your frailty. Let them have that just like you should have had that. Because most people who do that don't have that experience of being able to hold on to their first superheroes and their first loves. Great stuff, Jenny. Talking sports yeah. from a woman's point of view. I love it. <laughs> you know what? You guys need to listen to the women more. <laughs> this is how it works. Understood. Thank you again, listeners, for another episode of Tell Me Why. And we welcome your input. Feel free to leave us comments in the comment section. We want to hear what you want to talk about. Let us know what you want to hear more about, and we will find a segment and, and discuss. We'd love to. Thank Absolutely. you again for tuning in. Bye. Bye.